That was heartfelt for a Monday morning. Is it Monday? Is it Tuesday? Is it Wednesday? Wednesday. It's a Wednesday. I have no idea. Hi, everybody. I'm Anita Rani, and this is my life in objects. This was a really difficult task for me because um, I don't really think of myself as an object person, even though I have a house full of stuff. Um, I'm not really someone who is very sentimental, so it was very tough. But the first object, my passport. I travel a lot. I travel a lot for work, um, which I love. I travel a lot for pleasure. And one of the greatest gifts I have in my life is the freedom to be able to go around the globe with one of these babies. And they're full of wonderful places that I've visited. And each one of these places has a memory attached. And all those memories will lead to a specific person or an experience or being in someone's home, um, because that's the privilege of being able to travel for work and make these fantastic programs is that I get to go to places that most people don't get to go to and I get to experience the milk of humanity and the joy of what it means to be a person on this globe. Um, but in all my travels, the one thing I've learnt is that people, guess what? We're all the same. We're all the same. Even if um, people in Papua New Guinea worship Prince Philip as a, as a god <laughs> and uh, Chinese like to eat chicken's feet, essentially, we're still all the same. As someone who travels a lot, um, oh gosh, I mean, it depends. Everybody likes to travel in different ways. I'm quite an adventurous traveler. I always like to kind of go to places that are slightly off the beaten track and talk to locals. I'm not afraid to talk to people, which is obviously why I do what I do for a living. And another essential travel tip um, is actually another one of my items. It's this. It's a soft pashmina. I've got a ridiculous amount of these <laughs> in my cupboard. I pick them up wherever I go. I get hot and cold. You get on a flight, it might be 27 degrees outside, but the flight will be like an ice box. So pashminas in your bag, perfect. They'll keep you warm whatever the weather, or cozy on a flight. Or I throw them over my head if it's bright daylight and I want to sleep. So you'll often see me like this. Totos! Have you been to Bombay? If you have, you will know Toto's. If you haven't, when you go, visit Toto's. Although I don't think it's quite what it used to be. So Toto's, when I was 21, I went to Bombay off my own back, self-funded to make my final year project for university, a 10 minute doc about anything we like. And most people made it about, you know, something to do with Leeds or West Yorkshire, but I went off to India to make it about women in Bollywood. <laughs> and I went to this bar, called Toto's. It's very cool, or it was. It's, um, it's a garage and they have half a Beetle, as in the car, Volkswagen Beetle, chopped and stuck on the wall and that's a DJ booth. And all the waiters are dressed in bright orange overalls, which now look like Guantanamo Bay overalls, but back then they were just, you know, working in a garage. And it is the first time in my life I sat down in a bar and looked around and thought, I could be anywhere in the world. This is super cool. I could be in London. I could be in New York. I could be anywhere in Europe. But everyone in the room is brown like me. And it was a real interesting moment for me because that's never happened in my life. Not that it's ever been an issue, but I've always pretty much only ever been the brown kid in the room for a long time. Uh, and so this was the first time in my life I was just surrounded by other brown kids doing what I do, having a pint on a Friday night and listening to really good music and having a bloody good time. And so uh, every time I go to Bombay, and it has changed a little bit, I have to make a little pilgrimage to Toto's. And actually this last time, which was only a few months ago, I nicked a few of these to have in my house. And it's gross and it's stained, but it's Toto's and it means a lot. Okay, still to do with travel and to do with just health are these. Oh yeah, oh, they smell good. I normally throw um, my running trainers in a bag wherever I go, because if I'm filming Country File or if I'm just in another part of the world, it doesn't really matter. If I get you know, half an hour free, I'll throw them on and I'll just go. And it's a really nice way to see a place as well. You can just explore, and especially if you're in the middle of nowhere or the countryside or along a beach. And it is my meditation. As someone who has quite a hectic life and a hectic brain and find it very difficult to sit still, it's actually um, a moment of calm for me, just running along in my own zone. 
Eyeliner, eyeliner, yes, yes, ladies. Eyeliner, eyeliner, because it's so much more than makeup. It's more than war paint. This actually connects me to a long line of women, I think, in my, in my family, because it has such a strong heritage um, in India, which is my motherland. I never, ever, ever wore makeup. I didn't have a lipstick. This is the God's honest truth, and you know it's the truth because if you've read other interviews with me, you've heard me say it before. The first time I bought a lipstick was when I got my first presenting job. Um, just, just wasn't that kind of girl. And even, like, although back then in the 90s, it wasn't, I just Doc Martens and kind of black nail varnish and you're good to go. And eyeliner. So at 16, um, most girls weren't allowed to wear makeup or whatever, or you know, 15, but my mum said, put some eyeliner on, do it, it'll change your life. Or maybe it was even 13, maybe it was younger than that. It was 13, because I remember going to school with it on and being told off. I say, have eyeliner, will travel. So even if I'm in the depths of sub-Saharan Africa, or you know, I've been on a long distance train journey, and they wake me up in the morning and say, Anita, get a camera in your face and talk about the experience. I mean, most of the, I don't need to go and put a full face of makeup on. I will, and you will, you will know that because you'll have seen me without makeup. But eyeliner, I will always make sure I'll put a little bit of this on, just a lick. Did you know that in India, they used to have lead in their liner? It used to be, it's called Surma. I wish I'd brought it actually. My granny's old, um, there you go, you start talking about things and you realise you do have objects. This beautiful metal, very ornate little metal um, jars and in them they'd have a metal stick and in it would be surma, which is this black paste and you pick out the stick and run it through your eye like that and it had lead in them, which is probably why my grandma had really thick jam jar glasses <laughs> from a very young age. But yes, have eyeliner, will travel. CDs. Uh, these represent music generally. Music, my first love. Um, it will be my enduring love. It's always there for me, no matter what. It's there for all of us. And you make that connection at a very young age. For me, it was, oh gosh, I, the minute I could watch Top of the Pops, I remember dancing in front of the TV, learning all the words to every, I still know all the words to loads of pop songs, like most of us do, if that's your thing. And then it just became my passion and my obsession. And I have a ridiculous amount of CDs, which is quite embarrassing. And records, I have loads of records as well. And they really are a pride, and I love playing them still. And sometimes on a Friday night, me and my husband will just get our records out and play one on, one off, like real saddos. <laughs> uh, what else? This ring. This ring is actually an object that has a sentimental attachment. As someone who didn't think I had those objects, um, this absolutely does, because it belonged to my uh, late great favourite relative in the whole universe, my uncle, my dad's youngest brother, Govinda Nasran. He was an artist, an actual artist who made money from his art. Imagine that. In the 80s, I'd go to my granny's and he'd come home from art college in his big uh, <laughs> green donkey jacket, his black Dot Martins, his big hair and his eyeliner. And he'd walk in from art college and go into his bedroom in the attic and put on Smith's records and The Cure and The The and he'd smell of patchouli and he was just the coolest goddamn bastard on the planet and then he got married and lived this magical magical life in Saltaire and as a teenager I would go to his house every weekend and would sit and listen to music and drink wine and just feel like an adult and we'd go shopping together and he'd buy me the coolest stuff. The first time I went to Paris was with him. He introduced me to art, he introduced me to fashion, music. He was my cultural guru. And even to this day when I go and buy clothes, um, he pops into my head and I think, would Uncle Gov like this? And then sadly he died. And it was the biggest tragedy to ever happen to me and to my family. Um, but that's life, isn't it? But yeah, but I, I'm the luckiest person alive because I had him as an uncle and this is his ring. There you go. Well, that was truthful. There you go. That was a bit of truth right there, my Uncle Gov. In fact, look him up, Govinda Nasran. 
you can see his art online. You should know about him. He was amazing. Okay, this little guy. This little guy is my Ganesh. Ganesh is the elephant god. Not that I'm religious, but I love um, art. I particularly love kind of Hindu uh, forms of uh, their deities. And I've got quite a few artworks in my house that are, have religious connotations just because I think it's beautiful. But this guy is really cool because I bought him the first time I went to India backpacking. So I've been going to India loads as a kid, with family, with work, but I'd never gone with a rucksack. And uh, I picked him up in the south, which is very different to the north, the south of India, where there are temples everywhere. And you can very quickly get temple fatigue, as I did. Um, but he's made using the lost wax method every weekend when I was doing Strictly, which was one of the most magical and most difficult experiences of my life and, and was life-changing, was life-changing in many ways. He would come with me to the studio and he would sit in my dressing room uh, just because I think he's a very cool thing. He's got wonky eyes, he's half elephant, half man. In fact, he's not, he's a boy with an elephant's head. Um, and he gives me good luck. He's the removal of obstacles. So, my little Ganesh. All right, this, this is a, a remarkable thing. This happened to me making my Who Do You Think You Are, which is an incredible thing to happen in your life anyway. When they phone you up and say, oh, we'd quite like to make your Who Do You Think You Are, you kind of go, are you, are you sure you mean me? Surely I need to be about 60. But it's one of those things that happened. And luckily they were able to tell the story of my grandfather, my, my maternal grandfather, my mum's dad who I'd never met because he died six months before my mum got married. But he's just this figure that's loomed large in my life because he was my mum's idol. So she talks about him all the time and I feel like I know him. And then I made my Who Do You Think You Are? And I really did get to know him because it was his story. He was in the British Indian Army. And what I didn't know was that he wrote a memoir, which is a remarkable thing for a man of that generation to do, the World War II generation, to do anywhere on earth. But an Indian man of that generation to have just the thoughtfulness and the intelligence and in, he, he's just enlightened to then sit down and write his story. It's just one of the most beautiful and um, uplifting and inspiring things that's happened in my life. And it's gorgeous, and he tells the story of his life. And yeah, I learnt all about him. Weirdly, when I was asked to do my Who Do You Think You Are, I thought, oh uh, yeah, well, you know, I'm not really that. I mean, it'd be fine to find out about my family, but as a, as a children of migrants, um, I kind of attribute who I am to my parents. They worked bloody hard. Um, I've, I know how hard they've worked, because I've seen it. And I've always thought that I'm a product of them and their hard work. And it was just my mum and dad and me and my brother growing up in Yorkshire and they ran this business. They worked 24 seven and their primary aim in life was to make sure that me and my brother had a great life. And so the idea of kind of going further back was like, oh yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting, but I'm not, you know, India's great, but I'm, it's not my country, Britain's my country. Uh, more fool me, because then you discover that actually we are a product of so much more and it's because my grandfather was this educated, enlightened feminist um, who then educated his four daughters and saw humans as equals, um, even at a time when he had every right to have hate in his heart because his family were, were slaughtered during the partition of India. He didn't carry an ounce of it. And it's because of that, my mother is who she is. And because of who she is, I am who I am. So yeah, all because of him this awesome dude, Sant Singh, who I never met. So yeah, that was quite a powerful piece of, powerful object in my life. So if my house was burning down, uh, the object I would have to save, yes, my passport. I hate admin, I absolutely hate admin. And uh, the thought of having to reapply uh, to get another passport, it's not very sentimental, is it, to say I'd, I'd save my passport? That's the practical me. I have maybe the ring, because it's easy, it's on my hand, and he was a huge influence. So maybe Uncle Gub's ring would get saved. <laughs>